Thanks for joining us to the launch and first webinar of the Technology and Policing Project, which is a new and exciting collaboration between the Tech Law and Security Program at American University, Washington College of Law, and Future Tense, which is a collaboration between New America, Arizona State University, and Slate. Over the course of the next um, several months, we are going to be curating content on Slate, looking at questions of policing technology and power. We've already started with a fabulous piece by one of our panelists today, Rashida Richardson and Amba Kak, that was, um, was, was put, up, put online on September 11th, and I encourage all of you to, to look it up and read it, because it's really fabulous. Um, we will also be holding a policing and tech symposium on November 20th and a serious series of webinars over the course of the year. So we hope you can join us for all of those. We hope you will submit articles for publication on Slate, and you, we hope that you will spread the word about this exciting new project. And now it's my privilege to introduce Professor Andrew Ferguson, who is a professor at American University Washington College of Law, a friend and a colleague, an author of the fabulous book, The Rise of Big Data Policing, Surveillance, Race, and the Future of Law Enforcement. And he will be introducing our other two panelists and moderating this panel today. And finally, before I turn it over to him, I want to remind you all that you can submit questions and, um, and the panelists will, will take the questions over the course of the next hour. So thank you for joining us. And I'm going to now turn it over to Professor Andrew Ferguson. Thank you very much, Jen. Thank you all for joining us and welcome to this webinar on power policing and technology. It is hard to think of a more important issue in America today, an issue that is at the core of what we are doing in government, what we're doing on the streets, what we're doing about personal liberty and freedom and privacy, and what we're doing about police power. I have with me two of the people I admire most who are national experts on this issue. Uh, Professor Elizabeth Joe and Professor Rashida Richardson, who are going to come in here and have a conversation without me interrupting. But my role is to get to introduce them. If, I'm going to start with Professor Joe. If you want to know about technology and policing in America, you should simply go follow her. Follow her on Twitter, follow her scholarship, read the, the works that she's put out just in the last five years. She has written substantive, serious, important, cutting edge articles on policing and self-driving cars, policing and artificial intelligence, policing in smart cities, policing and automation, policing and police robots, policing and private police robots, uh, policing in uh, algorithms, uh, procurement issues of policing surveillance technology, all of this involving the Fourth Amendment and DNA. And that's just the last five years. She is a national voice uh, in this space. She's brilliant, and I'm so privileged that she is here today. And she is going to be in conversation with uh, Professor Rashida Richardson, who's newly at uh, Rutgers Law School as a visiting scholar. Uh, Professor Richardson uh, brings to uh, her new academic environment uh, the world of what she was doing with AI Now, where she was the director of policy research, and literally changing how the world, not just America, but the world is thinking about uh, artificial intelligence. Thanks to her leadership, uh, AI Now delved into the world of policing and predictive policing. You should read her article on dirty data about exposing the connection between predictive policing technologies and the data collection systems in policing in general and the problems in policing in general. Read the article that Professor Daskal mentioned about uh, in Slate about intelligence data systems. And again, just follow these two uh, brilliant uh, scholars uh, who are we're privileged to have today uh, to begin this conversation. So this is a conversation about power. Technology involves power. Policing involves power. And when technology is added to police power, there are real concerns about expanding government power. This webinar conversation is about whether technology can ever adequately respond to police power. Can it cabinet? Can it limit it? Can it regulate it? Can it help move toward abolition if that's where we want to go? So I want to begin with a slightly backward looking question, a framing question, and ask our two panelists. I'm going to start with Professor Joe first, looking over the past few years, and maybe even the last decade, if that's where we want to go, what would you, have, what would you say has been the relationship between new technologies and police power? 
what are the examples of technological change uh, or, or even technologies that have changed policing that we need to be thinking about today? So I'll begin with Professor Joe and I'll ask the same question in conversation to Professor Richardson. So uh, hello, and uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm really excited to participate in the launch of this project. I think this is an ideal time, a necessary time to have a national conversation about police and technology. So it's wonderful to um, have watch this project uh, begin. Look forward to seeing the, the fruits of the conversations um, as you guys go forward. So to answer the question, going back over the past decade, I suppose one of the ways to think about it is not to focus on a particular technology, but rather to think a little bit about uh, the biggest change really in a more macro sense. And that's been the increasing and in, uh, reliance on artificial intelligence, so very broadly defined. You know, let's call it machines to approximate human thinking. And the result is what I've called an increased automation in technology. So that comes with some huge changes, whether we're talking about, you know, the specific uses of facial recognition or license plate readers, or even um, uh, using software to analyze massive quantities of, of DNA. It has a couple of big changes or shifts as a consequence. So what that really means is, you know, it amplifies the power of police in ways that isn't just the replacement of human police officers. Police can now do What's obvious is that it decreases the visibility of policing. If so many of these important decisions can be done with machines or with artificial intelligence, that means human beings are doing less of it and that becomes less visible. And what that also means is I think we're seeing a de-socialization of policing. I mean, increasing distance between police and their communities means there's just less social aspects of policing happening. Now, all of this is, you know, it's not, uh, you know, it's not sci-fi. All of this is uneven. It's a bumpy road, but we're talking about very broad developments. And I think the other big key aspect besides just the broad uh, reliance, increasing reliance on artificial intelligence and automation is the important private sector influence in policing when it comes to technology. So many technology tools are developed in the private sector by the private sector for the police who are essentially end users, they're consumers of these technology products. So that means they're kind of passive customers for these technology products that are literally shaping their basic policing functions, their investigative powers, who they look at, what they're looking at, what their focus is. And so what that means is that this is a real challenge for the ordinary ways we think about policing, right? Because it used to be that police procurement, you know, what, you know, what, vendor, what vendor relationships uh, police have, not a very sexy topic in policing. Nobody really cared about it. Um, nobody cares about you know the brand of car police uh, drive or the kind of you know uniforms they have. But when it comes to procurement today, to the extent that procurement is about which tools are they going to buy or lease or adopt, this becomes an essential question in what policing is today. So lots more to say about that. But those are my sort of broad thoughts here. So let me ask you, uh, Professor Richardson, to also help us frame this, to tell us the same idea of uh, what you see as the impact of technologies and policing over the last however many years you want to go back. Yeah, thank you um, for having me. And what I'll do instead of trying to replicate what Professor Joe talked on, I'll tr just try to build um, from there. But first, I wanted to also clarify um, some of what we're talking about when we're talking about police power. And I think a useful example is if you look at any municipal budget, and we're talking about cities, towns, and states, police usually are taking up a lot of that budget. And part of that is because over time, we're increasingly using the police as the primary government response to social harm and social issues. Um, and so that's part of the power relation we're talking about is the use of police and dealing and managing and negotiating a lot of social relationships in society. 
And um, to build off of what Professor Joe already said, it's we see amplification and a lot of other issues, but we also see the legitimization and justification of police practices um, with the use of a lot of these technologies. And that's in part due to both governmental and societal problems we have of automation bias or technological neutrality. And these are concepts that try to capture the fact that we assume because something is based on data or because it's um, technology, it is more neutral, impartial, or better than a human process, when really technology is just a human creation and susceptible to the same problems and flaws as us as humans. And sometimes when these technologies are used by police departments or even marketed as helping to deal with issues of discretion um, or abuse, what we're actually seeing is the legitimization of these processes, practices, and policies when really we should be scrutinizing them more. And another problem that technology introduces into police and power is um, it can sometimes skew or even obfuscate the function of police in society because we don't actually see what's happening. And I think a good example of a technology to illustrate that is social media monitoring and that a lot of people are using social media, what you put out is public. And, um, but with not everyone's social media is being viewed by law enforcement and used by law enforcement to build cases or to assess the criminality of certain individuals and what happens when these subjective judgments about what to use um, that we're putting out into the public or using this information without the context that in which it was stated causes several problems. And we're seeing this with um, the use of social media posts or even music videos being used to help prosecute tons of young kids. Um, so it, I think we have to think about all of these different shifts that are happening simultaneously and also compounding over time. Um, and they all serve to completely change or worsen the imbalance between power um, and police and its specific role, as I mentioned in the beginning of my comments in negotiating and framing our social relationships. Can I just jump in here? Um, I want to echo something that uh, uh, Professor Richardson said, which is just a really, really important. I mean, she raises the the, the question of like, well, you know, what is what is policing for here in this context of technology? And I just uh, I have a further comment on that, and that is, it's a really difficult question in the United States to talk about power, policing, and technology when we don't have a national police force. These are literally thousands of decisions across the country. So, you know, to, to the extent that a large urban department, whether it's Los Angeles or New York City, can have a kind of process where we think about, oh, there's at least a fight against about transparency and what we're going to see and the tools they're using. For all, each New York or LA or Chicago, there are thousands of cities where there's 10 officers in the force. Um, their data might be, you know, literally some hard drives they bought at the local uh, uh, office depot. Um, the, the questions about technology and power vary enormously. So the answer really is that there isn't a one size fits all kind of uh, a rubric that we can use here because these decisions are so um, heterogeneous all across the country. So at best, what we can do are raise broad questions, but communities actually have to have really specific kinds of things they're looking for. So let's talk a little bit about that, because you know a couple of the points that you raised, both about visibility, that it is both hiding what police are doing, but also in some ways uh, legitimizing what police are doing, that we are hiding uh, sort of the powers, also hiding the procurement decisions, but also because the money's flowing to police, granting them more power to do more social control, social services uh, uh, work. Um, in terms of particular technologies that worry you, recognizing the fragmented nature of policing, but which are the ones that are uh, uh, being applied even more unequally? Uh, Professor Richardson mentioned social media, which I think is a good example of whose you know, feeds are being watched. But how should we think about uh, and the discussion of power of how these technologies are impacting different communities differently, uh, not just geographically, but also in terms of race or class uh, or other uh, uh, distinguishing characteristics. Uh, and either one of you can go. Uh, Professor Richardson, you actually sort of brought us up with social media. So I'm curious about your thoughts of that. I know you've written about protective policing. I know you've written 
uh, about other sorts of algorithmic, uh, algorithmic decision-making systems? So the, I've been struggling with this question, to be quite honest, because I don't, I, in some cases, it, it is very clear that certain technologies don't work equally or don't work for all or can be used in very abusive ways to give some specific examples. As you mentioned, I've written, we've both written about um, predictive policing and how that's been used to perpetuate existing problems in police departments, an example being that if a police department has engaged in discriminatory racial profiling, then and then they integrate that same data into a predictive policing system, then it's more than likely that that system is going to predict that the same communities that the police department was targeting are sus um, susceptible to more criminality, even though the actual um, crime data may not reflect that. You have facial recognition technologies, which simply don't work for someone that looks like me. Um, and other technologies where it's either something inherently wrong within the system as to why it produces disparate outcomes or its application is used in harmful ways. So I think you ha kind of have to divide those out into whether there's something inherently wrong with the technology or in how it's being used. But also, I, we're talking about a lot of technologies that are based on data. And there's also a problem there with the underlying data that these technologies are using, whether you're talking about predictive analytics, recommendation systems, or even um, technologies that are simply automating tasks, they necessarily rely on historical data, whether it's yesterday or a decade ago. And if that data is reflecting the social inequities in society, then the application at scale of that data is going to produce certain harms as well. And based on the history of policing in this country in particular, we know that people of color, specifically Black, Latinx, and Indigenous people are overrepresented in police databases. So that's going to lead to um, unwarranted scrutiny of those communities. We also know that um, discretion and subjectivity plays a lot into decision making and these technologies help either hide some of that discretion or displace it in certain ways. So um, there can be targeting of people with disabilities or other uh, marginalized groups in ways that the, either the technology is helping conceal or skew, as we mentioned, or amplifying the um, use and uh, ability to apply authority by police departments. Yeah, and I guess I would just uh, uh, add to that and say it's, I don't think there's any particular technology that stands out more than any others. I think it's right to focus on the data. It's right to focus on biases in the data. And I guess maybe the broader way to answer this question is to say, I think we need to be concerned anytime that technology is kind of used as a kind of thin veneer of a justification to dr uh, draw more sc scrutiny to some communities than others. And I think one of the big um, uh, misunderstandings here is that you often see an argument that says, well, you just can't arrest someone because they've been on social media and said something, or you can't arrest someone because it looks like there's some sort of technological match. But maybe that's the wrong question. The, the, maybe the larger question is that these technologies make some people more visible than others, some communities more visible than others, and that makes it easy for surveillance to increase in some communities. And surveillance, even without direct physical interference, is a burden. That's what we often don't realize, that just the mere fact that you know that your community is heavily watched is a psychological burden. It's an emotional burden that weighs on us in ways that the, our traditional ways of regulating the police don't really readily capture. And that's one of the really basic problems with police and power. That's the theme of our conversation today. Can I actually jump in and say one more thing? <laughs> this is so, so. so inspired. I feel like we're going to keep doing this. Um, another problem without trying to hyper focus on any one technology too is that Technology, because of the reasons that I mentioned before of either technological neutrality or automation bias or any other term to capture our fascination with technology as the silver bullet to everything, 
also leads to the fact that we don't explore other alternatives and that in itself is a harm too and that there are many non-technological or even community-based alternatives to addressing social harm or social issues in communities that are completely off the table once a technology is purchased or the idea of technology solving the problem is part of the public discourse. So I think we do need to think more abstractly about what harm is and what is being lost by the application of these technologies. And that's in part, let me jump in to, to that. And that is that, you know, if you think about it, um, it's not really an either or, but it's often presented that way. And here's the insidious part about the private sector influence, I think, in policing today. And that is those technological options are so tempting for very understandable reasons to police departments. Here is an easy fix to make you better on crime control. Here is an easy fix to help you reduce X kinds of offenses in your area. And very often it comes with an even greater sweetener. Maybe it's free. Maybe there's a trial for six months that's absolutely free, no strings attached, right? Or it's at a greatly reduced rate. Or more importantly, there is federal funding for that federal funding in a way that isn't available for just having more police officers work with, let's say, mental health care providers and create some kind of creative solution. So er there's every structural incentive for the police to just try out all these tools. And in a way, I think what Professor Richardson is getting at is this idea of, well, maybe that's the wrong way to approach technology, not just, a, well, that's cool, let's try it, but some a very basic question of, what are we trying to accomplish here? You know, what is the goal here? What does success look like if we adopt X police technology? And that's typically a question that's just never asked. And I, I think it's a, it's a wonderful conversation for where we are in America today, where we're talking about uh, removing police power through defunding or abolishing the police, the recognition that these structural inequalities are part and parcel of policing in America. And the question is whether police technology has any role at all. If, as we've sort of said earlier, that the technology, certainly the technology as it has been for the last decade, has sort of uh, reified power in policing, like the technology is sold to police to be used by police, to be uh, adapted by police and not the communities. Is there any role for surveillance technology that could be consistent with the sort of the defund police movement that has arose after the arose after the killing of George Floyd and the sort of cascading incidents of police brutality that we've seen across America. Is there any way to think about technology that doesn't reify those deep uh, structural power inequities that are are what they are? We know they are. So I think it's first important to clarify what is meant with calls for defunding the police, because I know there's been tons of publications that kind of blur um, that ask. And what I really think advocacy around defund the police is about is about reframing our conversation about the role of police in society and also how we deal with social harm in society, not necessarily that police need to be gone tomorrow, but maybe police are not the people to be sent when someone's having a mental health crisis. Maybe it's a social worker or someone who's actually trained in that. And I think with reshaping those conversations about how we deal with social harm and what exactly is the role of um, the police in society, we then should have the conversation about technology. I feel like in policing um, and tech, it's often, the state or the police predefine what the concern or question is and then technology is applied to that and we never actually have these larger holistic conversations about what does what do we need to have a safe and equitable society and then what is the role in technology in advancing that and i hope that with these conversations that are trying to really address the structural conditions that lead to the social inequities we have in society we can first get that more imaginative um, framing first of like, what is it that we're actually trying to create? And then what is the role of technology in advancing that instead of this sort of perverted, um, we've already decided what the problem is and we're applying this technology that was designed to solve that specific problem in the first place. I think that's right. And I, and I think one of the, the key issues here is not, to the extent that I, I interpret the defund the police movement as a way of raising questions about resource allocation 
and priorities, I think it's those basic questions that have to be answered first and then think about what technologies um, are useful to that end, rather than the world we live in now, which is largely to throw all kinds of technologies at an undefined problem, worry about regulation later, and then realize there are harms, which for many people who look at this um, are were entirely predictable. Um, and that's been our general historical arc with every kind of surveillance technology used by the police. This idea that, well, I'm sure it will work uh, without defining what work means. I'm sure the harms we can remediate later without realizing, well, maybe they're very difficult to remediate. And without thinking about regulation uh, beforehand in many, many instances, whether we're talking about facial recognition technology, body cameras, license plate readers, you know, it's not technology specific. It's basically a an approach to police technology that we're sort of sadly lacking here. And so to the extent that um, a defund the police movement means a reassessment, a fundamental reassessment of what the police should be doing, uh, then, you know, it's not a technology specific kind of mandate or prohibition. And in fact, it, I think it's a little bit mistaken to think of, well, here are the technologies we need to ban because that's just not the way things are going to work, particularly when those technologies are being used um, very, you know, with rapidity in the private sector. You know, we, we're, are we worried about license plate readers? Well, sure, we can be worried about those things, but we wouldn't want to necessarily ban them by the police, would we? Because we know that neighborhoods can join together and buy their own network. Why would why would we allow that in the private sector and decide that the police couldn't have that at all? So. Some of these things are really about trying to agree on what the basic questions are when we decide what is the relationship between police technology and power. And I don't think we've come to that consensus and I don't see anyone in a position of power trying to raise it in that very basic way. I think there are certainly communities who are raising that right, as part of the abolish police uh, movement of saying that the answers won't come from city hall, they won't come from a police chief, they have to come from communities, and we have to sort of step back of the traditional role of policing. But in the now, in the moment now, it almost sounds, it's interesting, there's both the, the recognition that the history of policing technology has been a history of missteps, of every time there's a new uh, uh, technology, there's the promise, then there's the reality, then there's the recognition of failure, then there's recognition like, yeah, we all saw that failure coming, why didn't we do anything about it? And then a new technology shows up and we're, we forget that what we've done. Um, and so one lesson from that is that policing technology, as it has always ar arisen and any kind of police surveillance, will always be fraught and we should just not go there. We have money that you know could come from the federal government, could come from state budgets, none of it should go uh, into police technology at that moment before we have these conversations with communities about policing and the role of police and the role of social services and other government. And that if given the keys to the, whatever, your mayor's ear or whatever, you would say, no, just don't spend another dime on any policing tech at this moment because it's just, we're just gonna repeat the same patterns that we've seen before. Is that what we're saying? So, um, uh I guess my response here would be, we're not necessarily saying not jump in, but I think we, you know, every community kind of needs a, a checklist for themselves about what questions they should be asking when there's a proposal to adopt new technologies by their own local law enforcement agency. And, and this assumes that they even know that this is going to happen. I mean, many communities now have sort of built into their model uh, notification to the police, but that's still not true as a kind of you know, nationwide practice. So we need a sense of best practices for every community. And what we're, we are seeing now, and, and maybe this has decreased some with the, the renewed attention on policing this year, but, and that is, um, you know, Communities need to have a sustained focus on their local law enforcement agency. Um, too often, there is a lot of um, attention to that initial adoption of a technology. And understandably, you know, local community members have many other things to do. They have jobs, they have families, uh, particularly during this uh, time of crisis. Uh, these are not the things that they can attend to. But the problem with police technology is that you need a long-term community engagement to figure out whether this is the best solution for a particular particular city or community. You need oversight, not just in the sense of, you know, should this be adopted, but also in terms of how, how are we going to measure success? What is, the, what is the police department here going to tell us about how this is working? 
Are we going to know whether it's not working? What are the things the police are doing to reduce harms in, in, in attendance to using that particular technology? That's hard work. It's hard work for communities, um, but it's as necessary as being as deeply involved in one's public school district. You know, you have to be really, really attentive to what's going on here for the long haul. And communities can make steps or take steps to gather together, organize themselves, because let's face it, some of these details are not terribly exciting, right? There's a kind of really cool, interesting tech aspect to it, but a lot of these things uh, are matters of budgetary decisions. You need someone who's good at accounting. You need someone who can help explain to the community what's going on with the data science here. All of these things are really hard, but that's kind of the, today in today's world, a necessary aspect of police oversight. And I'll just build on what Professor Joe is saying in that I also think communities need to think about what redress means um, for them because it's not the same in all communities and a lot of the problems that we're seeing in policing uh, relate to pre-existing structural conditions and what that specifically is divestment in communities. So if you haven't had proper resources and are experiencing a slight uptick in property crime as a result, then like that's not necessarily um, connect, it, like I think there's a tendency to pathologize the behavior of specific individuals um, to explain crime when really it's connected to these policy decisions from for decades in communities. And that's what needs to be focused in on, but also communities for themselves need to think about, well, what does redress look like if we are able to reformulate the conversation in this way? And I think that's part of a larger difficult national conversation we're having because for so long in this country, the way we deal with redress is retributive justice in some forms. And what really we need to deal with is addressing a lot of the harms that have been compounded over time, um, specifically affecting marginalized communities in a particular way. Um, I also want to jump in here and say, you know, another way to think about this problem is that technology isn't, and thus far we've been having this really interesting conversation about technology as a potential harm, right? But there's lots of ways in which technology can be good or useful. I mean, there's a really interesting dynamic that we can identify right now. I mean, uh, you know, a big locus of police violence, uh, unexpected police violence is through traffic stops, right? Um, traffic stops that go terribly wrong, right? Where someone is, is hurt or even worse killed uh, during the course of a traffic stop. So let's take the world as it seems to be going, right? There's an increasing amount of automation in our world, in policing and everywhere else. Um, on one take, that seems really, really bad, right? But, you know, we appear to be moving towards a future of driverless cars. The tech companies are going towards a future of driverless cars. They're already anticipating um, how government agencies would have to remotely stop those cars. So you think like, well, from an informational privacy perspective, that's really scary, right? That's kind of the one, one group of people who are saying this is bad because there's so much data drawn from there. But maybe if informational pri privacy isn't your top concern, maybe if literal physical harm during a traffic stop is your top concern, then maybe that technological development would be welcome. Maybe for some communities, uh, at taking literal human police officers out of the equation would be a welcome development. And, and I, that's what I mean by saying it's not obvious that every new police technology is going to be rejected by communities who have had problems with their local police. And I also don't think that there's necessarily going to be consensus, a national consensus about which things are truly harms and which aren't. It really depends on your point of view and your sort of historical experience with policing, I think. Well, let's talk about that because in some ways the argument that the use of technology can reduce the physical policing harms of policing has been used to justify like video cameras on the streets uh, in certain communities and other kinds of surveillance technologies that are invasive in the surveillance way, but not in the physical way. Uh -huh. But I think that, you know, communities have rightfully pushed back on that to say there is really an invasion there. So I guess my question is, if we were going to, you know, sit down in a particular community right, at a church or you know, a community center and have a conversation about a proposed, you know, smart car technology, how would we be thinking about the, the sort of use of government power to change power dynamics in that community? What would we advise the community? What would we advise the companies trying to sell products? And what would we advise the police chiefs who are 
uh, thinking, hey, there's another cool toy to you know, help do what we have to do. Well, I think it first starts with the question of what, what, why are we even trying to use the technology and for what um, aim? And I feel like that from my own participation in these processes on a, in a local government level, we never actually have a conversation about those questions. Um, and it, and that's what I meant earlier when I was saying it kind of, the use or acquisition of technology kind of forecloses other options. And it doesn't necessarily mean that non-technical options were the other options on the table, but it forecloses the conversation about what are we even trying to solve for. Um, and I think if you, if we were to start with having an open conversation of what are our community issues and what do we, like, what do we need or what are we trying to solve for in the role of technology, then we'd get a different kind of development, which I think Professor Joe was starting to speak of. Like, if you're looking at the boards or even who's involved in some of these technology companies, they don't have people like us <laughs> on it, first of all. It's usually police chiefs, other police adjacent um, people, and then other technologists. And though, and we could also get into the demographics of who are in that room, which is typically white males and not <laughs> women, people of color, and other people who are disproportionately targeted by policing. But I think if we changed who's in the room and shaping those questions of what are we even trying to solve for, then we could have more productive conversations about the inclusion of technology in society and it's just not the presumption that a technology will cause harm but instead looking at it as a tool and actually trying to see what is it a tool for I think that's right and I and I think one of the you know the key problems here again is we never get to that first principles question which I think professor Richardson is getting to and that is you know drawing in a community you know if you think about it you know with the talking to our audience here today I want to ask all of you how to answer the question of when was the last time you were at your uh, local law enforcement's public agenda meeting? I, I bet the, the percentage is relatively small, right? Because you know they're they're not well attended. I've been to them. I've been to them when they're literally just two other people in the room. Um, that's a problem when you have these really basic things happening and the community. I you know they need to get involved, they need to know what kinds of questions to ask. And I think that's kind of the guidance that, you know, people like Professor Richardson and Professor Ferguson can, can kind of help address. Like these are questions that in plain language of their police departments. And we're not getting that from any, anywhere. We're not saying like, you know, you have to become a policing expert or you have to have a degree in CS now, but you do have to know like what to ask. You do need to know like, well, is this technology gonna work for us? Some basic questions like, well, ask your chief, you know, is it, do you know what it means for this technology to work? Right? I mean, how are you training your officers to use this other than just saying, you know, here's what the manual says, go ahead, good luck. I mean, there's got to be more to it than that. And that, that basic problem, I think we keep returning to this question of, you know, what, it's not enough to throw, it, throw technology at the problem when we haven't solved the question of what is policing for and what exactly is the problem itself. That's intimately tied up with everything from the you know, defund the police movement to broader questions about community harm and mitigation. And again, the, the theme here is that it's not technology specific. So the advice I would give for communities is try to organize yourselves in a way that you can have sustained focus and uh, oversight of what's going on in your local police department. And one of the things that you both have written about so well is about how even the definition of the problem or what the data you're collecting is changes any potential solution. So if you're trying to think about the information that police collect, your answers are going to go to something else. If your question was what do communities need, you might be collecting a whole lot of different pieces of information that might lead you to very different sort of uh, solutions. And some of those solutions would probably not be technological at all. We'd like better schools and more, uh, you know, uh, after school programs and not more surveillance cameras. So I think that's definitely uh, a piece of it. I want to remind the audience that there is this Q&A. You can, uh, people are writing their questions and they're coming in. So we're going to go to that uh, in, in a, a few uh, moments. Um, but so I, I'm taking away, and this is a struggle for people who write about policing technology, is that when the conversation is about power, 
And it's about the lack of community power to have a say in the ways that police police communities. Um, any conversation about technology is largely a distraction in the sense that it is hiding the real structural problems that we need to focus on. And I think that that is sort of what is coming out. And I think what's interesting is the way you framed in the beginning about even the technologies themselves, like AI, because of its, its sort of hiding of the visible nature of what's going on, uh, only exacerbate that. So if we wanted to div div you know, devise the space or place to begin a conversation about changing the conversation about policing power and technology in America, uh, is it necessarily just going to be your local board, you know, whatever your, your local community, because policing is so fragmented? Uh, uh, can it, can it have, can we have a, a national conversation about this? And if so, how would we develop that? Um, we absolutely can have a national conversation. Uh, what we need are kind of uh, an articulation of best practices um, that uh, have input from all of the relevant uh, communities and actors who have a stake in policing. And to think about, you know, even if it's as simple as a checklist to develop what, you know, across the country, what do you need as a community to answer questions about your own technology? Because let's face it, you know, the very idea of technology is frightening to people. You know, I can't, most people can't, uh, you know, explain to you why their, uh, you know, their, how their autocorrect works, right? How are we going to have a conversation about how this uh, development of suspicion came about based on an alert a police officer received. You know, how can we translate that into something where communities understand these are the questions we need to ask. Here's what I need to know in the long term as a member of my community. And yes, we can have a national conversation about it um, in ways that are more complex, more nuanced than let's have a ban or, uh, or, or my favorite, let's just have a warrant requirement, which never gets to the deeper questions about, you know, what is this gonna mean at a very granular, granular level for individuals, right? Because not everything is simply about a warrant or an arrest, as I've already said, it's really about these deeper fundamental changes between police and their communities because of artificial intelligence, because of uh, uh, automation, and let's face it, uh, because of, what you might call a kind of bastardization of the technology, right? This idea that you say it's technology, but it's actually technology is the basis for um, adding on many layers of discretion and bias and saying, well, it's just the tech, right? That's a totally different harm we haven't uh, addressed thus far. But those are the kinds of things that everybody should be aware of on a national level. I also think we need like a national history lesson <laughs> of sorts, because even taking this the tech out of policing context, the, what's at stake and what benefits can come from technology very much are constrained by where you sit in the social, economic, political hierarchies of our society. And I don't think most people understand that fact in itself, but also why is that? And that's where history comes in and understanding the social context of policing, both on a localized level and nationally, can really help in understanding that not everyone has the same relationship with police, not everyone has the same positive or negative outlook on police. And how can we move forward in thinking about reform and the proper role of police when there's so many disparate experiences and viewpoints on policing in itself? And I think having a better understanding of that social history is really important for us to have critical conversations about where to move forward. So I'm going to move to some of the questions from the Q&A, but I, I want to mention, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that there is a, a, a checklist of sorts that was created, the Harvard Law School Criminal Justice Policy Pro Project in partnership with the Stanford Criminal Justice Policy Project, created a, a checklist of sorts on policing technology. It was mainly directed toward police chiefs to sort of have them think through these fundamental problems, but it was also in recognition that they would have to face communities who were concerned, and rightfully so, uh, about these technologies. And I think that that is a resource. I know the Policing Project in New York has done uh, work on it uh, in the same kinds of audits and technological audits. But again, that kind of presumes that there will be technology in this, as uh, in the conversation. And it may be the case that if you understand your history and you look at surveillance and policing in American history, your answer to that question of, well, what do you think about this should be no, just no, just look at history, no. Uh, and that's not 
irrational. It's actually pretty rational if you look at the history of surveillance in uh, communities of color uh, and black communities especially. And that may be where we need to start in order to build something else. So I want to bring up some of the questions in, in the Q&A. So one question comes from, uh, you know, is about politics, right? That the political pressure of senior officials and police chiefs and primarily uh, is part of what's going on here, right? They are getting pressure from the community, who that community is, is an open question, to adopt these high-tech uh, surveillance tools because they want to be seen as cutting edge. Sometimes they want to be seen as progressive. Sometimes it's a cost-effective uh, mechanism. Uh, and that it is you know, unfair to critique chiefs who are responding to political pressure when uh, it's political pressure that is actually doing that. And why is that, I guess, not legitimate when uh, it's usually not the chiefs wanting to do it themselves, they're responding to something. And isn't that part of uh, something we have to address? Well, I want to complicate this question because that presumes police are responding to all community needs when the reality is that they're usually responding to those who are in closer proximity or have some type of power relation with police and or government officials in some way. And I and there's often tons of community concerns that are never responded to. And I can even say here in New York City, we have like that imbalance happening where tons of communities are like, we don't want tech or we actually want a better understanding of the technology that's being used. Um, but a, a, I guess you could say a silent majority is whose interests are being advanced and you wonder why. And it's, it's like there's whole histories of the financialization um, of policing technologies and how that's entangled with government. But I do hear um, <laughs> what what is in that question. And I do, th it, it, politics are involved, but I also think you need a sort of nuanced analysis of the politics in play and that there's also politics that go into politicians not wanting the proverbial blood on their hand and, and, and pushing back on police departments, whether we're talking about the adoption of technology or um, abusive practices. So. I, I, I'm not really answering the question, and I'll admit that to whoever <laughs> the um, person who asked it. But I, I do think there are politics in play, but you have to think about whose politics are um, being advanced by police and whose are being ignored, because it's often racialized and it often very much aligns with the power dynamics within a certain jurisdiction. Um, I, I think to, to, to also respond to that question, I, I, it's right. I mean, it's very hard to just blame police chiefs for adopting the technology, particularly if they say, look, we need, we need to try something different. I mean, that's a very understandable motivation. And, and I suppose the, the problem is much deeper, right? I mean, imagine if we said abstractly, um, why don't we approach policing in 2020 by having every department uh, be approached at a vendor conference by one or two companies offering them a year of free X technology and see if it works. And one or two, and they don't have any choice uh, about what the products are or how they're made, and they just do it. And then you factor that into a police chief saying, well, I had to try something. We'd never design a system of democratic policing from the ground up in that way. We would want police chiefs to say, here are the things I want to find out with technology. Here's what the community also says they need from the technology. Someone designed this technology for us. That is not the world we live in. We live in a world where the police departments are basically consumers. They are passive consumers taking whatever's out there, which is usually not a full robust set of choices and certainly not something that we as the public have easy access to. That's a fundamental problem and it goes well beyond just a police chief saying, well, I had to do something by adopting this technology. How do we, uh, how do we restructure that basic system? I don't have an answer for you, but that is a real, real problem today with uh, police power and technology. It has almost has nothing to do with police in the first instance. Just to add a little bit more, because this is something Professor Joe and I both focus on, but there's also tons of problems in procurement where there's not enough friction in the process. So as Professor Joe was illustrating, police are going into like the target of police technologies and picking things off the shelf, but they're not necessarily doing market research on what is the best technology to serve my community needs. Often they're being approached by some marketing or salesperson from a vendor 
being told this is the silver bullet solution for your community, not doing any more research and then going to their procurement person saying, I need this yesterday. So I, we also need to think about the processes within government that are leading to this sort of blind use and purchasing of technologies that are being sold as the solution. And then we later find out it didn't work. And that, that is the fundamental challenge for understanding policing today. So I think being a policing scholar in, in 2020 is not just about knowing the constitutional regulations of police. It's not about knowing the standard the state laws about what police should do. It's about knowing something about procurement. It's knowing something about intellectual property, believe it or not. Um, all of these things which used to have very little to do with policing are absolutely fundamental to knowing about some of the key drivers of how policing is changing. That's a real challenge for anyone interested in the basic topic of police technology and power. For all you law students out there, it's time to write your comments on these, uh, these issues because they're really important. Or, or you know, academics and uh, policymakers. Like this is the hidden uh, power behind these technologies. Almost none of these technologies uh, arose uh, through truly public discussions. And the few places where there are, are through democratic oversight boards, like in Oakland and around San Francisco and Seattle and other places that have done that. Uh, but even those have, you know, created their own problems in terms of, uh, uh, you know, as Professor Richardson said, like true democratic accountability. Not everyone is in that uh, meeting to debate their views and a lot of times, money and power and connections control, and that has happened uh, uh, a bit too often. Um, one, I wanna bring up another question that came up from the audience that I think was probably uh, triggered by uh, Professor Joe's comments about how there's this you know, parallel world of uh, non-government consumerism. And so the question is about the sort of dissonance in people's views of people who are concerned about policing technology, but then putting ring doorbell cameras on their home who are concerned about the growth of facial recognition uh, in mugshots and other places, but are happy to have the convenience of facial recognition in their consumer worlds back in the day when we went to stores. Uh, so what do we do about the fact that there is not only this dissonance, but this dissonance cuts against the move toward maybe not looking for a technological solution to uh, social problems? I'll let you fight it out, whoever wants to go. <laughs> uh, Professor Richardson, it sounds like you wanted to jump in, so I'll let you. Yeah, I was actually thinking. <laughs> um, I I mean, part of, usually when I get this question about like consumer products, and I, I point out that like technology is a tool, there's tr inherent trade-offs to it all. And I think we need to think more critically, whether on an individual basis or a societal basis about where those trade-offs are falling and who they fall on. I think that's more on the societal question of there may be an immediate or even incremental benefit of a particular technology, but it could also have disproportionate harms for particular subsets of one community or inherent trade-offs that you're not particularly thinking about, whether mentally in that we lose certain skills um, from adopting that technology or we lose privacy or other um, principles that are related to the convenience that we get from a particular technology. And I think that's right. There is an absolute dissonance. And I think the thing that concerns me most with the consumer use of these things, particularly as they become more and more networked, in other words, as neighborhoods band together for facial recognition or for uh, license plate recognition, uh, that has to be layered upon a topic that uh, Professor Richardson has already raised, and that's our history. Um, we have a strain of violence in American history that is directly tied to vigilantism. And the thing to be worried about is, you know, policing is one topic, of course, but there's also the very real possibility of technologically driven vigilantism. And that is a, you know, I suppose that's a webinar for another day, but um, it's really concerning, of course, because it takes that policing power, leaves it in the hands of people who with no training whatsoever and with far less regulation. So it's a worrying dissonance and something people really need to pay attention to. Um, so I'm mindful of time. So I'm only gonna ask one more question from the queue. Uh, I will say my answer to that question about the difference of the consumer is that anything you're giving up to a private company is one you know, at most worn away from the police. So the, the line isn't terribly uh, strong and you should realize that you are, what you think is private is not very private. Um, so there's a question about 
uh, harms that have been compounded over time uh, because of the interaction of police and technology. Um, and the question is, where should we center our, our focus for thinking about it? Should it come from communities, community organizations, sort of, uh, you know, community or organizations that sort of stand in the stead of communities, sort of, you know, uh, national nonprofits that might represent, uh, you know, civil liberties or racial justice or those, uh, or uh, other places. Like, where do we center this conversation? Where should we reach out to after this seminar and say, hey, you need to start a conversation. I saw this really cool webinar. It's amazing. I want to get involved. I think since um, we're talking about police and these are always localized issues, it should start within a community and we should center the voices of those who are disproportionately harmed and most marginalized because like there's the overall theory of change if you try to create solutions for the most marginalized group, every the trickle down effects stem to everyone and I think that's how we should be thinking about these conversations. I personally am not one for symbolic representation of having national organizations or someone who, who is saying they're the um, speaker for an entire community as representing it because you don't get that localized nuance or truly understand the impact. Um, but I also understand like we're living in reality where everything is mediated through a computer <laughs> right now. So that may not always be practically um, available. But I also think there's little things we can do as individuals. And, and that's also like talking to your neighbors. Like I know I've had some contentious debates with other New Yorkers about like the adoption of rain, like Amazon rain cameras. And I'm like, do you really think you're going to be robbed? Or are you just doing that because you like the security and don't understand how that enables profiling against marginalized bodies in your neighborhood. So I think it's like being comfortable to have those types of critical debates with neighbors and peers and then being open to having larger community conversations, but knowing whose voice needs to be centered. And it's usually those that are on the like lower part of the power um, dynamics. Um. You know, I think one of the basic things you can do as a citizen is to uh, tell yourself this matters to you and you're and that you want to spend a little bit of time on it and, you know, get hop off of next door and hop onto something else and figure out a way to engage your neighbors to say, you know what, I want to get a community group going where, you know, we promise that one of us out of the hundred of us is going to attend, you know, every single uh, uh, public police meeting. Uh, and take notes and uh, discuss it. Um, you know, one of the things about American society that I think is often um, overlooked is people can really get up to speed on lots of things. There are community discussion groups of very high specialization on gardening to, you know, chess to everything else. You can become a local expert on policing and we just need the will and the drive to do so. And, th and that's where to start. And I think communities are local experts on, on policing. They know better because they've been policed. And the question is how to give a uh, voice. So I'm mindful of time. We have a hard stop at 1 p.m. And I want to be respectful. But I want to just say thank you. The, the goal of this uh, webinar was to start a conversation, not give answers necessarily. That We got great answers and great ideas. Uh, but it was to start a conversation that needs to go beyond uh, the participants here and into your local communities. Uh, the issue of policing is at its fore. The issue of surveillance and policing and technology and policing is right behind it. Uh, and it needs to be part of a national conversation. So I encourage you to reach out to those local groups uh, and to reach out to people to start and continue this conversation uh, because we need more voices uh, into uh, uh, the larger conversation. So once more, a thank you to Professor Joe and Professor Richardson. A thank you to uh, Jen Daskal and the Technology Law Soci uh, Security Program at American University of Washington College of Law, and to uh, Slate and to Future Tense and Arizona State and to everyone who participated here uh, with us. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your engagement. And let's continue this conversation. So thank you all. Uh, it was great fun.